In the Shadow of the Valley by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 7 Martin watched Bronze as he clutched his head, but did not complain about his injury. Bronze, you all right? He looked over and nodded. I'm fine. The blood just dried and now my paw is stuck. Kathresh walked closer to Bronze and ripped his paw from his head. Ow! Hey! She shrugged. It had to be done eventually. A little warning would have been nice. Ow! Kethresh looked at Martin. And what about you? Hmm? Oh, my leg is fine. It stopped bleeding a while ago. A voice rang out from the left. Hold it! Don't move! Oh, it's you. Arbalist materialized from the bushes, still holding the crossbow he stole. I thought you were dead. Hello again, Kothresh. She nodded in his direction. Hello. Arbalist turned to Martin. Why is she here? She's coming with us. I didn't agree to this. Martin frowned, looking Arbalist in the eye. Here we are, chased by felines through the woods. And you're denying the company of another? Arbalist stepped closer to Martin and stared him down. It's you they're chasing, not us. Bronze came between the two. Don't you think those soldiers would be harassing us anyway? Besides, as soon as they find that cart you left behind with all the dead bodies by it, they're going to come after you too. Arbalist snorted. My point is, we shouldn't be following Martin. He has no idea where he's going. Martin growled and snapped his jaw. <sighs> You're in no position to criticize me. You killed a defenseless feline in cold blood. Yes, the enemy. I killed the enemy. So what? He was out cold! Kithresh chuckled and cut in. <laughs> Maybe you should stop yelling and greet our guest. Martin and Arbalest wheeled on Kithresh, who was standing next to a cloaked figure. It was giggling. You two are so adorable. The stranger threw up their hood to reveal a creature none of them had ever seen before. She was beautiful. Her odd facial markings of soft red and white snaked across her small, slender face. Her eyes darted around at the four, and she smiled. I was told I would find you here. My name's Niv. Kathresh smiled to herself at the dumb expressions on Martin and Arbalist's face. Bronze seemed like the only one who could keep his composure. A pleasure, I'm sure. Forgive me for asking, but how did you know we were here? My mate told me where to find you. I followed his directions, and here you are. Martin gulped. Who's your mate? I don't know any of your kind. Niv held up a black-gloved paw. He shall explain all. Come. Arbalist shook his head. Wait, wait. You expect us to just up and follow you? Without an explanation? She looked slightly puzzled, but turned back around and sighed. You are right, of course. Come. Instead, we'll go to a place nearby that is safe from the felines chasing you. I will try and explain there. She pointed into the woods, where a cave could be seen. Now all four of the travelers were perplexed. Kathresh tapped Niv's shoulder. How did you know? Please. They are close. Surprisingly, Arbalist was the first to follow Niv. If she knows a place to hide, what's the harm? And so, the four followed the strange and stunning person deeper into the woods. Garth? Are you in there? Garth pulled the blanket tighter over himself, the cold winter chill biting his nose. The sky had clouded over, and even though it was noonday, it was dark and gloomy. Rita looked into the cage, then at the napping guard, as Garth answered. Y yes I am here. She rushed to the bars and grabbed them, looking at Garth with sympathy. And sadness. You sound so cold. He shivered, shuffling closer to Rita. She reached through the bars and took his paw. Garth placed his other paw atop hers and spoke. Cole forbade me from speaking to you. He forbade me too. Garth carefully planned out his next words and each of his responses, anticipating any possible contradictions as he nuzzled against her paw. Have you spoken to him? She looked guilty. No. I've been avoiding him. He he plans on 
taking you away from me. She sniffed, and Garth thanked his lucky stars. This would be an easy one. Peter, I want you to listen to me. I was forced into this whole thing. The money, I needed it badly. Very badly. Uh, I regret what I did. Very much. His voice cracked as he choked up, something he could only do after years of practice. Rita stroked his head. I know. I know. He straightened up, looking Rita in the eye. They're going to execute me, Rita. You have to let me out of here so I can atone. Rita melted under Garth's pleading, soft look. He seemed sincere, but a nagging part of her brain told her to think about this. She hesitated and stepped back a little. If Father finds out, I... Garth fell to his knees. Please, Rita! They're going to draw and quarter me! She bit her lip and glanced at the guard. The keys are on the table. Be careful. Rita took one last look at Garth's broken form and quickly tiptoed over to the guard. She lifted the keys easily from under the guard's nose. She unlocked the door slowly as not to make any noise. Garth slipped out, pulling the blanket closer to himself. He darted to a chest that sat in the corner, digging through the contents until he pulled out his clothes. Groaning as he pulled the fabric over his injured arm, he tied the blanket like a cloak. Thank you. He was about to leave, never to come back, but something inside him made him stop. He stepped up to Rita and kissed her quickly, then darted out of the tent. Rita did not waste time making herself scarce. She was tempted to follow Garth, but when she stepped out of the tent, there wasn't a trace of him to be found. She drew a shuddering breath and walked towards her and Cole's tent where she knew he would not be at that time of day. Miri was doing what she usually did during the day, sewing. It had become somewhat of a coping mechanism, something that could be easily dealt with, predicted, controlled. However, it was hard to concentrate on her work because of the myriad of activity going on around her, starting when Troy began chattering to another slave, strangely excited. Did you hear the rumor? They're letting us celebrate the Day of Flame. The other slave shook her head. What? Nonsense. Why would they do that? I don't know, but I heard the guards talking. They said that they were letting some of the townspeople set up a bonfire and had to keep a close watch on them. I'm sure it's the Day of Flame bonfire. A few other slaves in the sewing circle muttered among themselves, and Miri sighed, cutting in. They're letting the townspeople celebrate the Day of Fire, not the slaves and only because they might riot if they were not allowed to celebrate. There's nothing we can do. There was a muttering of agreement and a general dampening of spirits. Troy sighed and threw the cloth she had just finished repairing into a nearby bin. I suppose you're right, Miri. I'm sorry, Miri, but Troy's right. Everybody looked to the door as Redrick entered, a rare smile on his face. They're letting us celebrate, too. Troy lit up and laughed. The gathered slaves began to chatter excitedly to one another. Do you think they'll have stalls? I love those little meatballs. How can you celebrate the Day of Flame without a festival? Of course there'll be stalls. Troy squeaked. What about liquor? They'll let us drink, right? Redrick shook his head. No. No drinking. Everything else is allowed, though. There was some disappointment, but the unprecedented move on the part of the regent had them all excited nonetheless. Redrick took a seat next to Miri as she continued sewing, trying to ignore the activity around her. Miri, are you not excited? What use have I for frivolity? This is the only break any of us will get, and you won't take it? Miri realized how ridiculous she sounded. Whenever Lar would allow them to celebrate canine holidays... She was usually the most active person in the community, helping her father create decorations for the food vendors. She sighed and put down her needle and thread. Sorry, I am not myself. Don't apologize. Can I ask you something? Yes. He fidgeted. Um, how about we tour the festival together? Miri's eyes widened. 
it was customary for lovers or family to walk around the festival together and buy each other things from the vendors. This, of course, was impossible under feline rule, since canines were prohibited from carrying money. To fix this, vendors simply gave away their food or trinkets for free. You want to go out with me? He nodded quickly. Y yeah, I... I thought because your father isn't here, you'd be lonely without anyone to go with. Of course I will, Redrick. He smiled, then stood. I can't be gone long. See you in a couple of days. She tried to smile back, but only managed a weak one. Yes, see you then. He scurried off, and she picked up her sewing accoutrement and resumed occupying her mind. This time, however, whenever she found her thoughts wandering, they were of Redrick and the festival, and not her anger. The cave was deceptively small. As Niv led them into it, all five had to crouch to make it under the low ceiling. After a few steps, however, it opened up into a large chamber. Arblist scoffed. They'll find us in here for sure. I knew this was a bad idea. Bronze sighed. You were the one who said, what's the harm? Niv walked up to a dark corner of the cave and disappeared. Martin blinked. Niv? Yes? Where are you? Come, the cave continues. Kethresh approached the place Niv had disappeared. She studied it. There's just a wall here. There was a giggle from within the wall. My, this is fun. Quit playing around. A paw waved from the wall, and with a start, all four saw it. Be it by some coincidence or clever design, the passageway was invisible to the naked eye unless you were standing in it. The passage turned to the right, and the back wall appeared to be another part of the larger chamber's wall with a simple optical illusion. Although Kathresh would not admit it, as she walked into the passage, she got a brief bout of motion sickness from the strange perspective. Wow. Did you create this? As the three walked into the passage, joining Niv, they saw the passage led to yet another chamber. She shrugged. No, and I do not know who. Pills showed it to me. Kethresh and Bronze lit up and spoke in unison. You, you know, know Pill? She nodded sadly. Yes. Alas, he is being held in the capital. That's what we figure too. They entered the second chamber, which was very dark. Niv produced a pair of sparking rocks and struck them together, lighting an unseen torch. It was tiny and smokeless and did not produce enough light or sound to be detected from the outside. Martin looked around the room and saw that it was well stocked with provisions, dried and cured fish, insect carcasses, and boxes full of root vegetables. His stomach growled, and he realized how hungry he was. The other three looked at the large variety and looked just as famished. Niv smiled and retrieved four plates, placing fish and vegetables on them. Where are my manners? Here, eat this while I answer your questions. As the other three began to eat, Martin asked the first question. May I ask what species you are? I have never seen those markings before. She frowned at his use of the word species, but did not comment on it. Well, we are called the Red Pandas. Bronze almost choked on his fish. <coughs> Red Pandas? I thought they had been wiped out by a terrible plague. She shook her head. No, not all of us. Though the plague still affects our community. Along with other things. Martin looked confused. What's a Red Panda? Niv giggled once more. <laughs> I am silly. She waved her paw before he could respond. Joking, I do not know where we come from, but we don't seem to fit into any of the other species. We mostly live in small communities and practice our religion. Martin nodded, intrigued. If he was a more religious man, he might have taken offense to the fact that she did not share his set of beliefs, but he was mostly interested in this group of people he had never even heard of before. You mentioned a plague. Do you know the cause? A pained look came over her, and she shook her head. It seems to be present when our children are born. Sometimes they survive into adulthood, but not many. It seems that it only affects children, and only in the womb, or as newborns. 
It is strange, but as a child is not infected at that time, they grow up healthy. However, the number of stillborn children and infected children has risen recently. It is sad, but there is nothing we can do. Bronze asked the question before Martin could. What kills the children exactly? They cannot stop bleeding if they are cut. Some just drop dead with strains bruises under the fur. Arbalist shivered, clearly unnerved by this invisible enemy. That's... horrible. Yes, but our fate is sealed. We will not be around much longer. Martin suddenly had no appetite, and he put down his food. Are you sure? Nothing can be done? A healer's tried everything, but it seems that once the child is born it is already too late. Kefresh licked fish oil off her finger. I have seen this, but only once, with one of my old friends. Her child had that same plague. Niv looked surprised. Is that so? I've never known it to exist outside our community. Arbalist finally ran out of patience. I would love to discuss powers that are beyond our control all day, but there must have been a reason you came to find us. And a method. She nodded and smiled self-consciously. Sorry, I do have a reason and a method, both of which are hard to explain. I want you to keep an open mind. After receiving a nod from each of them, she began her explanation. My mate, Lynn, he's a seer. Arbalist stood up. Well, I've heard enough. Let's go. Martin tugged him back down. Sit. What? Seers aren't real. I know what you are thinking, Arbalist. But he is the real thing. His eyes widened. How did you know my name? Lynn told me, of course. You are Martin, you are Kathresh, and you are Bronze. Arbalist was not convinced. He was enraged. You've been stalking us, haven't you? She sighed, walked over to Arbalist, and whispered in his ear. So only he could hear what she had said. He turned completely white and did not say another word. She continued. Now, I don't know why, but he wants to speak with you, Martin. Me? Yes, you. He said something about bridges, eyes, and destiny. When I pressed him on it, he sent me away to find you for and told me a little about you. Martin gazed into the torchlight as he contemplated this information. I will go. Bronze nodded. I think it would be interesting to see your culture. Kethrash nodded as well. An arbalist looked up at Niv. What you said? Never repeat it. I know. He looked down, extremely calm. Niv turned around and took a portion of food for herself, and the cave dwellers ate the rest of their meal in complete silence. Ziff watched the mouth of the cave as his two brothers napped. The stranger had led his quarry into the cave, and now the wait was on. Of course, he did not plan on attacking, but simply keeping an eye on them. It would be easy to continue tracking them once they emerged from the cave as well. He would follow them, catch them with his small army, and repair his and his brother's pride. He grabbed some snow and watched it melt slowly in his paw. Tezar would get her revenge, and soon... Rita knew she couldn't hide from her father forever, especially when he found the cage empty. She could tell the search had started. Soldiers ran around the camp, digging up the snow with their paws. Harima was among them, thoroughly combing through the tent and talking to the guard on duty. Rita eavesdropped on his interrogation, placing her ear on the tent fabric as the two talked, beginning to regret her actions. So you were asleep? Yes, sir, and I apologize. It got very dark and- Save the excuses for your superior. I'm here to find things out, not scold you. <sighs> of course, Captain. Where were your keys? There was silence for a moment. Then the dog responded. I had them right here, under my nose. And after you woke up? They were over here, on the other side of the table. Harimao chuckled. Someone moved them. Someone in the camp. There was silence for a while. Rita wondered what was going on until a giant shadow materialized over the fabric of the tent, cast from within. Rita, come here. 
she knew it was pointless to run. So she gulped down her guilt and walked into the tent. Harimau dismissed the guard and tapped the chair. Sit, please. I'm sorry! I couldn't let you kill him! He wanted to atone for his sins, but you were going to cut him to bits! I couldn't just- Rita, slow down, please. She breathed deeply and sat in the chair. <sighs> sorry. Harry Mouse sat as well. You're in serious trouble, you know. Cole has the authority to have you imprisoned. Rita gasped, and Harry Mao raised a paw. He won't, though. You're right. Harry Mao and Rita looked to the tent flap, where stood the stone-faced Cole. I won't throw my own daughter into a cell. Father, I know you're mad- Damn right I'm mad! <sighs> but I know it wasn't your fault. What are you talking about? Cole nodded to Harimau, and he quickly made his exit. Cole took a seat. He told you we were going to execute him, didn't he? Of course, you said- I changed my mind. I told him he would serve a prison sentence and his life would be spared. Rita's brain took a few seconds to register that she had been lied to. He- Did exactly what I warned you he would do. She remained silent, and so did Cole. He reached out and took her paw his voice less one of anger and more of concern. I do not blame you, daughter. I know what a fickle thing the heart is, and Garth clearly did as well. Rita was beginning to have the fog lifted from her brain, but part of her resisted. But we... I mean... He was real! I didn't fall in love with a... a ghost! <sighs> I'm sorry, Rita. Perhaps you will learn a lesson from this. Rita could not believe what a fool she had been. The whole time she had known Garth, he had lied and betrayed her, and she couldn't see any of it. She looked at the table, internally kicking herself. Cole stood. Please, think about this, but know something. I forgive you. He walked for the exit, but turned and looked back at Rita. We will be attacking through the Arden Forest in a few days. Polish and sharpen your sword, and pray you do not have to use it.